This is NTD Evening News. Live from our global headquarters in New York City, here's Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. In another significant announcement, President-elect Trump selecting Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to run the Department of Health and Human Services. Trump calls the position the most important role in his administration. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more from West Palm Beach. President-elect Trump on Thursday announcing Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as his pick to lead the Department of Health and Human Services. That's a sprawling department administering health insurance for millions of Americans, regulating food, approving different kinds of drugs, and responding to infectious diseases. And he's going to help make America healthy again. In a statement, Trump says Americans have been crushed by the industrial food complex and drug companies who have engaged in deception and misinformation. He asked that the department under Kennedy will play a big role in helping ensure that everybody will be protected from harmful chemicals, pharmaceutical products and food additives that have contributed to the overwhelming health crisis in this country. Trump has repeatedly indicated on the campaign trail that Kennedy, the third party candidate who dropped out to endorse him in August will be in charge of health policy in his future administration. Robert F. Kennedy cares more about human beings and health and the environment than anybody. Let him go wild on health. I'm going to let him go wild on the food. I'm going to let him go wild on medicines. Kennedy has voiced skepticism towards certain vaccines and has vowed to target causes of chronic disease and childhood illness. He attributes his support for Trump to a common goal of ending censorship and making America healthy again. You want a president who's going to get the corruption out of Washington, D.C. And don't we deserve a president of the United States that's going to make America healthy again? Meanwhile, the position that Kennedy has been tapped for would require Senate confirmation. While some Senate Republicans have said they would greenlight all Trump appointees, some others have signaled that some picks by Trump would have a challenging confirmation process. Reporting from West Palm Beach, Iris Tao, NTD News. And Trump just announced that he is tapping attorney Todd Blanche as a deputy attorney general and Emil Bove as a principal associate deputy attorney general. Bove will also serve as acting deputy attorney general, while Blanche is in the process of being confirmed by the Senate. Trump has tapped at least four Republican lawmakers to join his administration. The nominations have generated strong reactions from both parties in both chambers of Congress. NTD's Washington correspondent, Luis Martinez, brings us more from Capitol Hill. That's right. President-elect Trump has tapped Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, to be his secretary of state. He has also tapped Congresswoman Elise Stefanik to be his U.N. ambassador, Congressman Mike Waltz to be his national security advisor, and Congressman Matt Gates for attorney general. Republican senators have already signaled they wish to see a speedy confirmation process. It's our obligation to try and confirm these nominees uh, quicker than we've seen in recent history. I think Congress's uh, hand is, is uh, it's by design strong, and uh, we should use those authorities to go ahead, vet nominees, and get them confirmed, as opposed to avoiding the hard decisions that the American people elected us to make. Democrats in the House and the Senate have expressed concerns over the nominations and also over the independence of the Senate. He does have a mandate to make changes. The question is, how much, of what kind? And I think it is exactly the Senate's role, historically, constitutionally, to put some boundaries or guardrails around how much change. But I, I can't imagine any Democrats supporting him. And then the question is, you know, what will they do with moderate Republicans? The Republicans have already shown that they're willing to act independent of Donald Trump's direct orders in the selection of John Thune as the leader of their conference. And so I imagine it's going to be an, an uphill fight for Matt Gates. Oh, you know, they're going to do the same smear campaign that they did with Justice Kavanaugh. But I will be clear about something. The Department of Justice never charged Matt Gates, And so the fact that these people are bringing this up, why aren't they interested in uh, uncovering what happened with Jeffrey Epstein or, uh, frankly, the Diddy list? I think it's pretty gross. Honestly, um, I think if Congress really wants to start with cleaning out the House, they need to start looking into how people are becoming multimillionaires off of a salary that's 175000 a year. The most controversial of the nominations is that of Congressman Matt Gates for Attorney General. Congressman Matt Gates was under investigation by the House Ethics Committee 
for allegations he might have engaged in sexual misconduct and illegal drug use. I'm calling on the House Ethics Committee to preserve and share their report and all relevant documentation on Mr. Gates with the Senate Judiciary Committee. The sequence and timing of Mr. Gates' resignation from the House raises serious questions. The vacancies left open by the outgoing lawmakers will leave House Republicans with a one-seat majority until the special elections are decided. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. What will Trump's new Justice Department look like and how will he use it to enforce laws both for Americans and for illegal immigrants? Tune in at 7 p.m. Eastern Time to hear what a former U.S. Assistant Attorney General has to say on Capitol Report with Steve Lance here on NTD News. That's at 7 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it. The state of Florida taking legal action against FEMA officials. This is for allegedly discriminating against Trump supporters during hurricane relief. Recent whistleblower reports reveal that FEMA workers in Lake Placid received orders to ignore houses that displayed Trump signs or flags. Following the reports, FEMA fired Supervisor Marnie Washington, but she claimed she was scapegoated and that similar conduct happened throughout other areas affected by Hurricane Celine and Milton. Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody said she is taking swift legal action to find out how far the political discrimination reaches. She said she wants to make sure all Americans who fall victim to devastating storms are served, regardless of their political affiliation. The lawsuit is against both current and former FEMA officials, including Administrator Dean Criswell. It seeks punitive damages. As Trump prepares to take office, Democratic governors have announced the formation of a new alliance, calling it a nonpartisan coalition of governors who will work together to, quote, protect the foundations of our democracy. Entities Arlene Richards has the details. Governors J.B. Pritzker of Illinois and Jared Polis of Colorado have launched a coalition group called Governors Safeguarding Democracy, just weeks before President-elect Trump is set to assume office. The new group, which includes former and current governors from both sides of the aisle, says they'll work together to prevent what they call authoritarianism and the undermining of democratic institutions. In a statement on Wednesday, Pritzker said the alliance was needed to protect the foundations of democracy and to ensure our institutions withstand threats and persevere in their mission to improve the lives of our people. Pritzker says forming the group is not a knee-jerk reaction. This is about uh, governors being able to talk to one another, uh, you know, in a, uh, an organization where we can share uh, interesting and new ideas about how to push back on policies that, you know, we think may be coming. The governors, both Democrats, will serve as co-chairs overseeing the alliance. Paulus said he's looking forward to working with the Trump administration however he can. But... It's important that we collaborate as governors to protect the people that we're sworn to represent. And he said the voters in Colorado voted in favor of measures that support abortion and same-sex marriage. Voters eliminated the state constitution's definition of marriage as being between a man and a woman. Part of the alliance's plan is to develop playbooks to enable governors to anticipate and swiftly respond to emerging threats. The group did not specify what those threats were. Meanwhile, California Governor Gavin Newsom announced plans to convene a special session later this year to address Trump's policies, which he says threaten the state's values. A spokesperson for Trump's transition team, Caroline Leavitt, said in response to the group's formation that the president-elect will serve all Americans, even those who did not vote for him in the election. Arlene Richards, NTD News. President Biden is heading to South America for a six-day trip to meet world leaders. He'll be meeting with Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping. NTD's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley has more from the White House. President Biden's in Peru attending the APEC summit, but while he's there, he'll be meeting Chinese leader Xi Jinping on the sidelines in Lima. Now, this is significant because it's the third and final time that Biden and Xi will be meeting since Biden became president. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was asked about America's greatest adversary as we transition into a new administration. He mentioned China and that the incoming administration is clear on this. Well, the competition with the People's Republic of China is going to be defining 
for what the world looks like over the course of the next 10, 20, and 30 years. And so that has got to be a paramount priority for the incoming administration. And the person who's been named as my successor, the person who's been floated as the Secretary of State, these are people who have very much focused on that challenge. He also said that a transition could have unique consequences around the world. There are a time when competitors and adversaries can see possibly opportunity uh, because you have this, this change in government here. We have to sustain over the long term the channels of communication at every level, particularly the military to military level. We know President-elect Donald Trump has billed himself as well as his incoming administration as being tough on China. Now he's mentioned putting a 60% tariff on all Chinese goods. And back in 2021, when he left office, him and Xi Jinping were not on such good terms as the Chinese regime attempted to cover up the outbreak of the COVID pandemic for weeks before telling anyone and even tried to put the blame on the US. As for Biden and Xi Jinping's upcoming meeting, they've repeatedly discussed many topics in the past, so these might be repeated this time, like the Chinese Communist Party's aggression in the Indo-Pacific, fentanyl manufacturing, and the shocking human rights abuses coming out of China. A U.S. State Department report in June details the CCP's practice of forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. The main target has been practitioners of Falun Gong, a spiritual meditation practice with moral principles. For over 20 25 years, Falun Gong has been persecuted by the Chinese regime because of its popularity and spiritual beliefs. After his meeting with Xi and finishing up at APEC in Peru, President Biden will head to Brazil for the G20 summit. Reporting from the White House, Jack Bradley, NTD News. China is set to inaugurate a new mega port in Peru as the APEC summit starts. How serious crimes could rise because of it, possibly impacting the United States. NTD's international correspondent, Arian Pastar, has the story. China is transforming a remote fishing town in Peru into a huge deep water port. That's to cash in on South America's resources. The megaport of Chiang is a $1.3 billion project. The majority of it is owned by the Chinese shipping giant Costco. But although it's an expensive project, locals say it's not going to help their wallets. A third of all residents in the area don't have running water. Impoverished villagers say the port is depriving them of fishing waters while bringing no economic benefit to locals. The usual fishing spots no longer exist because they have enclosed them. They have destroyed the bay. Advocates for the port argue it does benefit locals to some degree. The thing is that we create more jobs. Not enough, but this helps. But many of Chiang Kai's 60,000 residents are not convinced. Some even say that serious crimes might start increasing because of the port. It is going to increase human trafficking, drugs, many things, more bad than good. And those aren't the only risks associated with the port, according to newspaper The Marine Time Executive. The U.S. Southern Command reportedly expressed concern that the new port will be suitable for Chinese naval deployments. It could also be used as a base for Chinese espionage activities here in the Americas. Chinese leader Xi Jinping is scheduled to inaugurate the port while he is in Peru for the APEC summit. Protests erupted a day before his arrival. We will have a look at APEC, just like Congress and our authorities. The APEC only benefits themselves. Demonstrators protested against rising extortion and insecurity in the country ahead of the summit. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Israel is keeping up the pressure on Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon, reporting more airstrikes in Beirut. This comes as the head of a prominent Lebanese political party calls for Hezbollah to give up its weapons so that the war can end. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. An Israeli airstrike hit this building in Beirut on Thursday as residents looked on, eventually taking out their cell phones to record the smoke rising from the explosion. Israeli forces reported launching a series of intelligence-based airstrikes on Hezbollah weapons storage facilities in Dahia, a known stronghold of Hezbollah terrorists in southern Beirut. 
Israel said that prior to the strikes, they gave warnings to residents in the area. Whenever the Israeli evacuation warning is issued, we are forced to take our children and sons out and sit in the street until it is over, and we go back. Sometimes when night comes and the warning is issued at 3 in the morning, we cannot go out. We are forced to remain with our children under danger. Israeli forces reported killing over 200 Hezbollah terrorists over the past week from the air and on the ground. And during ground operations in southern Lebanon, Israel also reported conducting targeted raids in mountainous terrain. Israeli troops recently found a 32-barrel rocket launcher aimed towards Israeli territory. A company commander in the Israel Defense Forces gave an update on their findings. Today, as part of the activity of the Maglin unit, we found an integrated route of Hezbollah terrorist infrastructure, launcher positions, weapons storage facilities, an underground position, and shaft, all just a few meters apart from each other. And apparently, some politicians in Lebanon are distancing themselves from the Iran-backed Hezbollah terrorist group. On Thursday, the head of Lebanon's largest Christian political party called for Hezbollah to give up their weapons so that the war could end and prevent further destruction to the country. Meanwhile, families of hostages held in the Gaza Strip for over a year now continue to plead for their loved ones to be released. We hope that Biden and Trump work together now to get the hostages back before the winter. And this former hostage expressed his gratitude for being rescued. So the whole operation and everything they did, the running in the greenhouses, the helicopter, everything brought me home safely and back home. And I thank them. They are a part of me until the end of my life. So far, 117 hostages have returned home alive. 101 are still being held in the Gaza Strip. And Israeli authorities believe at least half of them are still alive. Jason Perry, NTD News. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. News satire site The Onion won the bidding to buy Alex Jones's media company Infowars. The sale was backed by families of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting victims. The families earlier sued Jones for defamation after he said the shooting was a hoax on his media platform. Jones owes the families over $1 billion in the lawsuit. The bidders in the auction were both those who supported the media company and those who are against him. The Onion now owns the Infowars website, social media accounts, studio, trademarks and video archive. Jones says he already prepared another studio and media platform in case the sale went through to a party unfavorable to him. The Onion said its exclusive advertiser on the acquired Infowars platform will be gun violence prevention organization Every Town for Gun Safety. Preparing for the next pandemic was the focus of a House hearing today. Representatives from the CDC, FDA and NIH were questioned on mistakes made during the COVID response and ways to move forward. NTD correspondent Jason Blair reports from Washington, D.C. The COVID pandemic subcommittee holds its final meeting on Capitol Hill questioning witnesses from federal health agencies. It includes officials from the CDC, FDA, NIH, and Office of Readiness and Response as witnesses. Some Congress members asked the witnesses how they are going to help restore public trust in the federal health agencies. I was and still am critical of the CDC's messaging surrounding vaccines during the pandemic, largely because it inserted itself between the doctor-patient relationship and it discouraged patients from asking questions. It downplayed and, in fact, refuted that there was infection, acquired immunity, and herd immunity. People were labeled as anti-vaxxers, radicals, and called other demeaning terms simply for questioning whether novel vaccines that had not been FDA approved were right for them. I think it's clear that in the aftermath of our federal COVID-19 response, you need to do a lot of work. There's significant work could be done to repair the trust between the American people and our public health infrastructure. A common response was to have more effective communication. We had a multi-pronged um, approach um, to try to communicate the risk in, uh, related to, uh, to vaccines. But again, I think we have a, there's a number of different communities in, in, our, in our country and we need to do better, I believe, at trying to reach those communities to talk to them about what are some of the, what are some of the um, issues they have with vaccine. Some members expressed concern with possible actions from the incumbent 
upcoming presidential administration. While I've appreciated the forward-looking focus of this hearing, I must point out that the incoming administration poses a serious threat to undo all of the progress that our witnesses have discussed with us today. Under the false pretense of making America healthy again, President-elect Trump and RFK Jr. have committed to an extreme agenda that promises to hamstring our federal health agencies and their essential work to keep Americans safe. The witnesses also made their cases on what programs and efforts they think are important to keep around for future crises. Other focus includes where to distribute funding and grants and how those grants are approved. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Jason Blair, NTD News. Following President-elect Trump's pledge for mass deportations, Los Angeles is moving to become a so-called sanctuary city. A proposed ordinance aims to block city resources from aiding federal immigration enforcement. NTD's Christina Corona tells us more. Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass met with immigrant advocacy groups as city attorney Heidi Feldstein Soto began drafting the ordinance for Los Angeles to become a sanctuary city. Initially approved by the city council over a year ago, the law would prevent city funds, staff and property from supporting federal immigration efforts. This includes sharing immigration status information and notifying federal authorities of immigrant detentions or releases. The draft was released Tuesday in still awaits a final vote. Former Mayor Eric Garcetti previously signed an executive directive declaring LA a sanctuary city for undocumented immigrants. However, it was never voted into law. Bass told KNX earlier this week that this needs to change before Trump is sworn in. Trump recently selected former ICE official Tom Homan as his borders are, signaling a strong focus on enforcement. Bass stated that she will do everything possible to ensure the policy reaches the city council for a vote before for the end of the year. Christina Corona, NTD News. It's unclear what Vice President Kamala Harris will do once Trump takes office, but polling suggests that if she ran for California governor, many residents would support her. NTD's David Lamb reports. In a UC Berkeley Institute of Governmental Studies poll, co-sponsored by the Los Angeles Times, 46% of voters in California said they'd be very or somewhat likely to vote for Vice President Kamala Harris if she runs for governor in 2026. California will be electing a new governor in two years. Current Governor Gavin Newsom can't run again because of term limits. On Wednesday, the director of the Berkeley poll said no single candidate stood out, with about half of voters not stating a preference. Atop the field at this early stage are Democratic Congresswoman Katie Porter and two Republicans, Riverside County Sheriff Chad Bianco and State Senator Brian Daly. Porter receives 13% of voters' first or second choice preferences were she to run. Bianco gets 12% and Daly 11%. While Harris wasn't a candidate in the poll, voters were asked in a separate question whether they'd support her if she entered the race. One in three voters, 33%, say they'd be very likely to do so, and another 13% would be somewhat likely. 42% said not likely. The survey was conducted online in late October. California's current governor, Gavin Newsom, was elected in 2018, and he's currently completing his second term. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Trump was able to secure the presidency thanks to rightward shifts among several demographics, including working class voters. Joining us now to discuss the shifts in demographics of Trump voters this election is Lawrence Wilson, political reporter at the Epic Times. Lawrence, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you again. Now to begin, the Republicans now securing a trifecta presidency, Senate and House. The Democratic Party is looking at what went wrong. Now, one big focus is on the working class, with the likes of Senator Bernie Sanders lambasting the Democratic Party for abandoning that group. Speak to us about this shift. Where did we see the biggest changes in terms of working class voters? Well, it, we saw it in non-union voters, in men, and particularly in uh, minorities who are in the working class. For example, uh, among Hispanic men, 43% of them, or only 43%, uh, supported Kamala Harris. And that's down from 59% supporting Biden in 2020. So a huge shift there. And one in five Hispanic men work in the building industry. Uh, so they're a good representation of what the working class is. Among black men, 77% supporting Harris. That's down 
10% over three election cycles from President Obama's last term. Now, Harris held her own with union voters overall at 53%, down a couple of percent uh, from Biden's uh, score with uh, union voters. But uh, these days, there aren't as many union voters out there. It's only about 10% of the workforce. So by and large, a big shift in working people toward the Republican Party. And Lawrence, from your reporting, what do you think is behind that shift? Well, when you talk to uh, working class voters, you hear a lot about the economy. It's the price of groceries. It's the price of diesel fuel. And I spent a good deal of time in Michigan covering this election. Of course, there's a lot of concern there about the auto industry and what's coming or maybe coming down the pike with uh, electronic or electric vehicles. They fear losing jobs in the auto industry. So we heard a lot about that. Uh, truckers talked a lot about regulations, and uh, we heard also a lot about immigration. Um, economy was the biggest one, but those other issues, very top of mind for uh, working class voters. And when it comes to these shifts, how does education level fit into this? And what about the level of income for those who voted for Trump this time? Yeah, that's, that's right. These are two of the Typical markers of the working class, education level and income level. Let's talk about education first. Uh, Trump did very well, 63% of the vote from people who never attended college. And of course, uh, many people who work in laboring jobs, uh, they don't have a college education, their work doesn't call for it. So that's a good indicator of what working people are thinking. Harris, on the other hand, scored 53% of the vote from people with a bachelor's degree, 59% from people with a graduate education. So we think of those as people in the professions, in the managerial class, obviously a big divide there. With income, Trump won the middle, I guess you'd say. Uh, he won the majority of votes from people who make between $30,000 and $100,000 a year as a household income. Harris won the majority with people making less than 30000 and people making more than 100000 as a household income. So that uh, middle income group uh, really sided with Trump in this election. Uh, so we see those two factors, income and education, a signal of the shift as well. And Lawrence, it sounds like while working class and Latino voters delivered a win to Trump this time, it's not a given for Republicans down the road. With that said, what does all of this mean for future elections? What do both parties need to do and focus on to win? Well, one of the things they need to do is to fix the problems that people are talking about. And the economy was the biggest one in this election, at least from what I've been hearing uh, from the people I talked to. Uh, some analysts say it depends just simply whether Trump can make good on his promise to dramatically lower fuel prices and uh, cut inflation, reduce prices of consumer goods. If that's the case, <clears throat> these shifts may stick around for a while. However, it's worth noting we've seen these little migrations before a few percentage points of one uh, ethnic group or one demographic group or another going back and forth between the Republican and Democratic parties. So it will really come down to whether or not Republicans can deliver on what they promised in these next four years. Lawrence Wilson, political reporter at the Epic Times. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. The U.S. economy was the same size as the entire EU economy back in 2008. Now, America's is 50 percent larger. Analysts point to one key reason. Here's the story. The U.S. gross domestic product was the same size as the European Union's GDP back in 2008. Now, America's is 50 percent larger. We are over-regulating and under-investing. French President Emmanuel Macron, speaking at the Berlin Global Dialogue in early October, said the EU could die. If we follow our classical agenda, we will be out of the market. I have no doubt. In past years, the U.S. has created most of the world's most valuable companies. Europe, 
none. It's going to get a lot worse. Economist Daniel Lacaye says Europe's overregulation problem is immense and not easy to solve. It's a very political entity. There are hundreds and hundreds of political bodies that try to present themselves as useful by uh, creating new legislation all the time. Lacaye says it's almost like EU politicians are racing to see who can create the most laws. Some acknowledge the problem but aren't doing anything to solve it. We need to find ways to be more efficient in terms of how we address it so that instead of this being an onerous paperwork exercise, it actually doesn't take away the resources and the budget from driving the business. Alina Timofeva advises tech firms in the EU. Her clients say they wish regulators were more transparent with what they wanted. The firms also say premature regulation really slows them down. Together, the U.S. and EU make up over a third of global GDP. And China's GDP is rising sharply, now at nearly $18 trillion. Federal law enforcement agents raided the downtown New York home of Poly Market CEO Shane Coplin yesterday. They seized his phone and electronics. Poly Market is a website platform where you can buy and sell shares on the outcomes of future events. For example, will TikTok be banned in the U.S. this year? The gambling website had President-elect Trump's odds drastically higher than those of Vice President Kamala Harris for weeks, differing from opinion polls. The Department of Justice is investigating Poly Market for allegedly allowing U.S.-based users to bet on the site. The company does not allow trading in the U.S. A Poly Market spokesperson said the FBI raid was obvious political retribution for providing a market that correctly called the 2024 presidential election. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Britain's decision to give away the Chagos Islands may face pushback from Trump's incoming cabinet. The islands are home to a key military base in a strategic area of the Indian Ocean. The British government says the deal will allay any security concerns the new administration may have. NTD's international correspondent Malcolm Hudson has more from London. British politician and longtime friend of Donald Trump, Nigel Farage, says there is hostility in Trump's team of the UK's deal to give away the Chagos Islands and give them to Mauritius. The islands are home to the joint US-UK Diego Garcia military airbase, but critics argue giving Chagos away is a major tactical blunder and will only embolden China. Whatever is said about a lease agreement, as we saw with Hong Kong, these agreements can very, very easily be broken. The British government said the Diego Garcia base plays a critical role in countering threats to regional and international security. Foreign Office Minister Stephen Doughty said the deal came about because the operation of the base was under threat. Um, international courts were reaching judgments, international organisations were taking steps not to undermine Mauritian sovereignty, and this threatened the secure and effective operation of the base. And in the absence of a negotiated solution, a legally binding decision against the UK seemed inevitable. He said he is confident the deal is the right thing for national security. Outgoing President Biden has supported the deal, but Trump's incoming national security adviser, Mike Waltz, has in the past urged the UK to keep control of the Chagos Islands, citing concerns over Chinese influence growing in the area. Trump's personal views remain unclear. Set in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the Chagos Islands are a cluster of about 60 islands. They have been in British hands for more than 200 years. After Mauritius gained independence in the late 1960s, more than 1,000 Chagosians were forcibly expelled to make way for the Diego Garcia base. Some Chagosians repeatedly took the UK government to court. In 2019, the International Court of Justice gave an advisory opinion that Britain was obliged to stop governing the Chagos archipelago as soon as possible. The deal to give Chagos to Mauritius includes an agreement for continued military presence on Diego Garcia. It's expected to run for 99 years with an option to renew. The deal has not yet been signed between the UK and Mauritius. Foreign Secretary David Lamy in October said the government intends to ratify the deal in 2025. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. At the end of World War II, German and American troops rescued a group of prominent prisoners taken hostage by the Nazis. Their descendants met this month to tell their incredible story. 
NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. The Bragshire Wilt say rests in a peaceful valley in the Italian Dolomites. But in the final days of World War II, the Lakeside Hotel hosted prominent hostages held by the Nazis. Carl Gerdeler's mother was one of the captives. My parents did tell me these things. When my mother died in 1993, all the family sat at a round table to recall what had happened in the past. Everyone explained what they experienced on how they got here. Caroline's grandmother told them they could come here and feel free at home until the Americans came. The hostages included the former Chancellor of Austria, the former Prime Minister of France, high-ranking British Army officers, and important German industrialists. The Nazis intended to keep the hostages as bargaining chips to escape after the war, but the combination of American and German soldiers and a courageous hotel owner led to their liberation. Many of the hostages had spent years in concentration camps. In the spring of 1945, the Nazi SS bussed them to South Tyrol in Italy. Christiane Gott's mother, sister, and two brothers were among the hostages. They uh, came to Niederdorf and to this hotel, Park Savilze, and then uh, the American delivered them and brought them to the Isle of Capri. Regular German soldiers in South Tyrol were supposedly worried about being prosecuted for war crimes. So they took the hostages from the SS and brought them to the hotel. The owner risked her own life to let them stay. Later, American troops arrived and liberated the hostages. Mary Therese Kreutz Kotzer is thankful her grandfather survived. I wanted to say that my grandfather was very shocked that his friends from the resistance, he belonged to the civil resistance, were accused and many of them were hanged. He was one who survived a real luck for my family. Caroline Heiss is the current owner of the Bragscher Wiltse Hotel. She says she's proud of the role that her grandmother played in helping the hostages taken to her hotel. I have still um, something written from my grandmother and she said, of course, when the Americans came, they had luxury, they had food, they could uh, had things to wear, uh, they had showers. American troops ultimately rescued 139 hostages. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. For round-the-clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.